In an earlier video, we talked about the use of LDA to generate ester enolates quantitatively for alkylation reactions. Combination of an ester enolate generated in this way with a primary or secondary alkyl halide, say an alkyl bromide for example, supposedly gives the corresponding substituted ester, which would have a structure like this. Now this looks all well and good, but we have a similar problem to the one we saw in the last video on the acetoacetic ester synthesis with this simple alkylation of an enolate. When the reaction is partially over, we have the enolate in the presence of the substituted product. The product has alpha hydrogens that can be deprotonated by the enolate itself to give a different enolate. And in fact, the enolate that results from this proton transfer process is more stable than the initial ester enolate because alkylation has installed an additional substituent on the alpha carbon. Further reaction of this substituted enolate leads to multiple alkylations. And that's a problem. That's generally not what we want, particularly in cases where we just want to install one alkyl group at the alpha carbon of an ester. So alkylation of esters is not without its problems. And if our goal is to get ultimately to a substituted carboxylic acid, we can't just alkylate an ester and then hydrolyze due to this polyalkylation issue. Alkylating acetic acid itself is also generally out of the question not only because of the possibility of polyalkylations, but also because when we treat a carboxylic acid with a base, the initial product is not the enolate, but the carboxylate anion. It's the oxygen, the hydroxyl quote unquote oxygen of a carboxylic acid that's the most acidic position. So the only way to do this is to generate some kind of dianion using two equivalents of very strong base. And then we have the problem of competitive nucleophilicity. O minus is a good nucleophile as is the alpha carbon. So we end up with a mess of differentially substituted products when we use this dianion, for example, in the presence of an alkyl halide. All of these problems indicate that we need a more deliberate approach for the synthesis of substituted esters or carboxylic acids. And the malonic ester synthesis, much like the acetoacetic ester synthesis, is designed to furnish substituted carboxylic acids, in this case, through a series of deliberate reactions. We start with a compound that contains two ester groups sharing a common saturated carbon between them. These are referred to as malonate or malonic esters, and they're beta ester esters since from one ester's perspective there is a second ester group at the beta carbon with respect to the first ester. Similar to the acetoacetic ester synthesis, the malonic ester synthesis involves three stages. First, alkylation through a selective deprotonation at this carbon between the two carbonyl groups, followed by treatment with an alkyl halide, then basic hydrolysis. This converts the ester groups into carboxylic acids, and then finally decarboxylation, and this replaces one of the carboxylic acid groups with a hydrogen, leaving us ultimately with a monocarboxylic acid substituted with the new R group that was introduced in the alkylation stage as an alkyl halide Rx. One of the reasons I really like talking about the malonic ester synthesis is that it brings together a lot of the fundamental concepts of carbonyl reactivity that we've talked about to date. For example, the acidity of a carbon alpha to one, or in this case two, carbonyl groups, as well as the nucleophilicity of the resulting enolate come into play. Additionally, we'll see nucleophilic acyl substitution coming in in the basic hydrolysis steps and even decarboxylation the decarboxylation step makes the point that we can think of an enol as a good leaving group, particularly in contexts where we protonate one of the carbonyl oxygens. So even though there are other ways to alkylate esters, you know, this approach with LDA generally works pretty well, the malonic ester synthesis is just a nice context to really summarize everything we've talked about with carbonyl compounds to date. So now let's dig into the details. The first step of the malonic ester synthesis is deprotonation of the malonate ester. And just as we saw for the acetoacetic ester, the malonate ester has a very acidic alpha carbon sitting between two carbonyl groups. So we don't need to use a strong base to deprotonate this carbon. We can use a relatively weak sodium alkoxide. And just like we saw in the acetoacetic ester synthesis, it's important that the R group of the alkoxide, OR minus, match the alkoxy group in both esters of the malonate. Generally, these R groups in the malonate will match. It's very difficult to synthesize a malonate where those R groups don't match. And they'll generally be something simple like methyl or ethyl, since they're going to get hydrolyzed off at a later stage anyway. After deprotonation to form a highly stabilized enolate, 
we treat with an alkyl halide. And because this is an alkylation process involving SN2 at the electrophilic carbon, it's important that this carbon be primary or secondary. Otherwise, the enolate will affect elimination within the electrophile. The resulting product is a malinate ester in which we now have a substituent linked to that central double alpha carbon, we might say. And it is possible to repeat the sequence again to install a second alpha group. I'll write the conditions for that, but I won't show the product explicitly. We'll just carry on the mono-substituted product to the next stage. So these SN2 alkylations of primary or secondary alkyl halides by enolates are very familiar to us by now. One of the beautiful things about the malonic ester synthesis, and the same is true in the acetoacetic ester synthesis, is that we don't need to use a strong base. Because of the relatively strong acidity of this alpha carbon flanked by two carbonyl groups, we only need to use a relatively weak alkoxide base to make this happen. The second stage of the malonic ester synthesis starts with the substituted malonate ester and our overarching goal is to ultimately cleave off one of the ester groups through hydrolysis of both of the esters followed by decarboxylation and that's going to leave us with a substituted carboxylic acid at the end of this thing. To do that we use an approach similar to the acetoacetic ester synthesis. Initially we treat with aqueous hydroxide base something like sodium hydroxide and water to convert each of the ester groups into a carboxylic acid or a carboxylate as the case may be through a nucleophilic acyl substitution process. I'll go ahead and draw it as a carboxylate since we're dealing with basic conditions. The important point is that the ester groups have been replaced with either hydroxyl or anionic oxygen groups. This is a hydrolysis process and keep in mind that mechanistically hydrolysis of an ester to form a carboxylate or a carboxylic acid is really just an application of nucleophilic acyl substitution. At this point we can carry on this dicarboxylate to the final stage. Typically we don't even isolate this dicarboxylate, instead opting to just treat it directly with acid and heat to drive off carbon dioxide. So something like aqueous hydrochloric acid at high temperature, say boiling water, 100 degrees C, affects decarboxylation. And I'm going to draw the final product over here on the right because mechanistically this is an interesting process. After all, we've got two carboxylic acid groups in the starting material, but only one equivalent of CO2 departs in this reaction, leaving us with a carboxylic acid. Why don't both groups depart? This is fairly straightforward to explain using the mechanism. In the acetoacetic ester synthesis earlier, we saw that the purpose of the acid here is to protonate one of the carbonyl oxygens. And the same thing happens here. This proton transfer has the effect of introducing positive charge into the molecule. And in particular, the protonation turns the alpha carbon between the carbonyl groups into a potential leaving group or nucleophuge, since the cleavage of this bond toward the alpha carbon would generate a neutral enol intermediate. So for example, water could come along as a base at this point and promote the elimination of CO2 from this intermediate. Through electron flow like this, we end up with a neutral ene diol intermediate with actually two hydroxyl groups linked to this carbon. And after that elimination process, tautomerization takes place to give us the final carboxylic acid product. So CO2 is given off here through an elimination type process. The electron flow shown here may happen over multiple elementary steps but gets the point across. And then tautomerization of the resulting ene diol intermediate gives us the final carboxylic acid product. And the net result, again, is the substitution of the alpha carbon of something that looks like acetic acid with some electrophilic CH2R prime group. Notice that a second decarboxylation event can't occur. The first depended on the protonation of the carbonyl group that does not become part of CO2. But in the final carboxylic acid, we're missing that second carbonyl group. So we have no good leaving group really after protonation of this substrate, since protonation of this carbonyl oxygen wouldn't lead to the elimination of any CO2 elsewhere in the molecule because there is no other CO2 group within this molecule now. Only one equivalent of CO2 departs because we're relying on that proton transfer to set up this ene diol leaving group. Subsequent proton transfers to this carboxylic acid group don't facilitate the elimination of CO2.